we talk about a lot, uh, issues of global poverty, especially when these affect women, uh, feminist theology, mujerista theology. And she is um, leaving us to go into the doctoral program in women and religion at Claremont Graduate University. So we're very proud of Linda for that. So with that, let me turn it over to Daniel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again, Cecilia. Uh, I'd like to begin in the fashion of Chris to thank some of the people that helped make this possible. Uh, the first is, of course, Cecilia Gonzalez Andreu, who was my instructor for US Latino last semester, uh, introduced us to the idea of going into the community and making this a part of our scholarship. Uh, the second would be Christopher Err, who actually invited me to go with him to uh, Dolores Mission. Um, kind of on a whim, he needed a translator. He wanted somebody to give him a ride over there. And I ended up falling in love <laughs> with the people there. Um, and of course, uh, Eli Hidalgo, who allowed me to continue meeting with her group uh, after Chris was done filming. Um, and then, of course, Linda, for taking the time to respond to my paper. I know she's dealing with her thesis, Claremont, and everything else in life right now. <laughs> um, OK, so I'd like to begin. <coughs> Uh, last fall, Archbishop of Los Angeles, Jose Gomez, delivered the inaugural Hispanic ministry lecture here at LMU. In it, he stated that the United States of America has lost her national story. He cites that a teaching of an incomplete history lays the foundations of the United States on the arrival of the Mayflower and the Protestant spirit at Plymouth Rock, ignoring a hidden history that recounts the spiritual legacy of our, of our country's Hispanic Catholic founders. This incomplete history is one played with conquest, violence, cultural confrontations, change, and suffering in God's name. It remains a sore subject for many, however, it is a history that cannot be ignored. In a country where over two-thirds of Hispanics are Roman Catholic, I wondered how the undocumented Hispanic Catholics of the United States might fit into the writing of this national story, if at all. Too often, these stories of undocumented Latinas and Latinos are ignored, swept under the rug, or worse, they are silenced. But there is hope in the project apartments of Pico Aliso and El Pueblo del Sol communities in Boyle Heights, California, where a group of eight to 10 women gather weekly to reflect on scripture and to begin to knit together los fragmentos de nuestras vidas, the fragments of our lives, that belong to the untold national story which Gomez alludes to. During the gatherings, I grew privy to an experience of brokenness that is longing to be put back together. These women who have named their group Divino Nino Jesus, the Divine Son Jesus, are the subject of my case study as I seek to expose the root causes of their suffering and need for healing. Elizabeth Johnson writes that coming together in faith, people become conscious of their situation. They pray, they study the scriptures, and seek actions which will begin to change things for the better. Last fall, I found myself in the modest home of Gloria, a member of Divino, gathered in a circle around an altarcito, a homemade altar. We begin the night with ointment. Sorry, let me just picture it here. Uh, and the sign of the cross before asking for God's blessing on our group and for those who could not be with us at night. Brief introductions follow our prayer. Brief introductions follow our prayer. And, I, and what I learned in those short introductions was that I was among a group of extraordinary women that identified themselves as mothers, daughters, aunts, grandmothers, sisters, and wives. They are a mix of first generation, sex gen sorry, second generation, and the veras no, no me recuerdo, I do not remember, generations. <laughs> Many of them are of lower socioeconomic standing in their early 30s to, mid to late 60s, and a majority of them are undocumented. Most of these women have left their homes and their extended family members in the de deepest regions of Mex Mexico, such as Zacatecas, Guadalajara, and Oaxaca. So you can imagine we're up here in LA and they're from down here. Often in pursuit of una vida mejor, of a better life available only in el norte, in the north. This is something told to them by their parents, their grandparents, their neighbors, their friends, and others that claim they have known someone that knows someone that has been there before. They have left their lives in a country that could not provide them trabajo y comida, food and work. 
After our introductions, we are introduced. We are asked by Sophia, the group leader Divino, to offer up our prayers to the group. What ensue are petitions for God to alleviate their hardships as these women express their profound need for healing, calling on God to guide them and grant them la paz que necesit necesitamos, the peace that we need. This need for healing and peace points directly to an intense feeling of suffering in the lives of these women. As we turned our attention to the week's readings and focus questions, the silent suffering of the women slowly unfolded in the midst of this budding community. An essential component to, to faith-sharing groups such as Divino is a sharing of one's experiences with the larger group in hopes that critical reflection on one's own experiences and their fellow group members' experiences will, will reveal commonality amongst them and help foster a community of support. For the Divino members, personal healing is sought by sharing one's experiences of suffering and revealing their vulnerability to the group in hopes that the group might offer a sense of solidarity, hope, and comfort in the midst of others just like them. The women of Divino offer one another their condolences and support and pray for one another's pain to be healed by God. Economic hardships, family tragedies, battles with depression and stress, and constant feelings of being en la lucha in the struggle or the battle are just some of the burdens these women carry. Feeling caught in la lucha is the umbrella under which many of their experiences of suffering fall. But what then is the cause of this constant feeling of en la lucha? Who do they struggle against and why? Where did this dream of a better life in El Norte come from? What causes us to suffer and how do we fix this? For some plausible answers, I turn my attention to the field of U.S. Latino theology. Many of the Divino members mention Una Vida Mejor as their primary reason for coming to the U.S., for looking for a better life, and note that they arrived here only to face the reality that such a life is inexplicably out of grasp. They, like countless others, have come chasing the American dream prom promised to them should they use, a, as theologian Daisy Machado shares, the keys of education, hard work, and faith in God to leave their homes and pass through the doors of opportunity and self-realization. If these three va values, education, hard work, and faith in God, are indeed keys by which we can achieve una vida mejor, then we must ask why it is so many Latinas and Latinos have set these targets in sight in their sights and yet have been denied the elusive American dream. Thus, we shall denounce and announce these keys as possible root causes of the Divino's member suffering and need for healing by examining how each of these keys has contributed to their belief that la vida is la lucha, that, the life, that life is the struggle. I think this is a picture of Sophia. <laughs> I missed that cue. Oh, we'll get to that. Um, the first step to understanding how education fails as a key to the American dream and promotes the belief that la vida es la lucha is through a critical reflection on the miseducation of American history. We must begin by acknowledging the guilty past of the Americas and our present barriers to a full ed fuller education that hides no truths. This, is, of course, this, of course, requires a brief re review of our guilty past provided by us by church, church historian and theologian Justo Gonzalez. To understand to some degree how misconstrued and blatantly ignorant some of our fellow Christian brothers and sisters are to our true American history, Gonzalez cites an interaction with an educated Anglo-American United Methodist layman who at the General Conference of 1972 declared with conviction that he was proud that he was the only major nation, he was a part of the only major nation in the world that has never engaged in wars of conquest. Gonzalez quickly points out how this misinformed Pride neglects that 12 years before the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, the Spanish founded the city of Santa Fe, New Mexico, supporting Gonzalez's premise that it was not Hispanics who migrated to this nation, but this nation that migrated to the Hispanic lands. And by no means was this, mi was this migration a peaceful one. Gonzalez writes that American history was taught in our schools and even to, agree in our, to a degree in our universities is guilty of promoting an innocent history devoid of land claimed sometimes in purchase sometimes by military conquest, and sometimes by simple annexation of territories no one was strong enough to defend. Much of this, ex this expansion occurred at the expense of Mexico, but there is also the saga of the Cherokees and the Trail of Tears that stands as a clear example of what took place again and again in America's guiltless national story. But why teach such a history? Gonzalez goes on to suggest that the reason why the country has refused to hear the truth in its own history is that as long as it is innocent of such a truth, it does not have to deal with the injustices that lie at the heart of the, 
of its power and social order. What it doesn't know won't hurt it. We must come to terms with the fact that our Spanish forefathers raped our Indian foremothers and populated this great nation. By teaching a history that omits these facts, we are choosing to forget that there was a very intentional and planned ejection and extermination of indigenous people throughout this country. People who have been permanent residents of the hemisphere for centuries. Omitting these experiences denies us a full history of our ancestors and destines us to repeat their mistakes. Gonzalez states that part of our responsibility as Hispanics and as human beings, I would say, I would go further, is constantly to remind us of our immigrant beginnings, of the Indian massacres, of the rape of the land, of the war with Mexico, of riches drawn from slave labor, of neo-colonial exploita exploitation, and of any other guilty items that may, we may be inclined to forget in an innocent reading of history. We must choose to remember so that we do not repeat the same actions taken by our supposed innocent national story and grant us a perspective which is afforded by a more open education on what it means to be in la lucha so that we do not deny our fellow human beings the opportunity to f fully partic participate in our own community. What then, is the, the, what then is la lucha? To put it into perspective, as UN statistics show, while forming one half of the world's population, women do three-fourths of the word, world's work receive one-tenth of the world's salary, and own one-hundredth of the world's land. Two-thirds of illiterate children, I'm sorry, two-thirds of illiterate adults are women. Over three-fourths of starving people are women and their dependent children. The women of Divino are a calm and collected bunch during their prayer. But when they begin to reflect on the things that cause them grief, La Lucha is revealed. Tears, loss of breath, and shaky voices follow. Quite often, the grief, stress, and depression that the Divino members speak of stems from their workplaces, seeps into their homes, and affects their personal lives. A saying comes to mind, quien quiere celeste, que le cueste. Whoever wants heaven, it will cost them. But it is, it is a cost that is worth much more than the cost of waking up before the sun rises for a job that pays below minimum wage because people like Lupe and Sofia pictured here cannot provide a social security number. It is the price of not being home in, in time to pick up your kids from school, getting home too late and too tired to help with their homework, homework, and sleeping for a few hours only to wake up and do the same thing again, sometimes six or seven days a week. <coughs> and at the end of the week or the beginning, sometimes a woman say they don't, can't tell what day of the week it is, bills go unpaid, groceries disappear, and birthdays and first days of school are missed. This is their lucha. Naturally, I experience great sorrow and empathy for the women as I listen to them share how each of their respective jobs has caused them angst. And yet, the women trust that el trabajo is una bendición, that work is a, is a blessing, detailing an inspiring confidence that God has blessed them with work even in times of economic hardship and a recession. Though positive, it is a, vis it is a vision skewed by a nation without the women's best interest in mind. It is a vision communicated in our schools, our media, and our conversations but a vision that has always been the ideal and never what the U.S. has actually been. It causes them to buy into the American dream and the myth that anyone can make it. It is generation upon generation of a country and political system that continues to claim to be the only America with a capital A, bearing its burdens on those who, who are citizens of Las Americas. Though flawed, it is also for fertile ground for re-envisioning. Gonzalez reminds us of the creation narrative, particularly are being made out of dirt as part of the original creation. It is good. It is a vision which Gonzalez believes contribu contributes to a new model of theological education and reflection that includes aching bones and the dirt under our fingernails. This re-envisioning is part of the hermene hermeneutical pri privilege of the poor of which liberation theology speaks, grounded not only in our oppression, but also in our constantly being ri reminded of our bodily existence by our aching bones. But we must not be careful to suggest that suffering is good and consequently that the, the oppressor's actions are good. This is wrong. Johnson shares with us the community, sorry, Johnson shares with us the commonly perceived pious notions by Latinos and Latinos that to be a good Christian, you should suffer quietly. You should bear your cross in the world and, and when you reach death, God will give you your eternal reward. That such is life is the lucha. To accept this is to accept his status of victim and obviously works to the advantage of the oppressor, 
that willfully exploits the oppressed. Gonzalez also writes that for generation upon generation, Indian people were told by word and deed that they were inferior. Such chastising and failed attempts for reconciling have been some of the many causes of the present situation of back-breaking exploitation of the undocumented Hispanic communities like Divino. But it's, it must not remain so, because the Virgin of, Guadal the Virgin of Guadalupe has been reminded that there is vindication for the Juan Diegos and Juan Diegas. The Virgin that Gonzalez speaks of, speaks of is the same Virgencita that sits at the center of our, of our altar piece. She is the same Virgencita that reminds us that we are valuable, we are wanted, and we are loved. And yet, our Virgencita is not the only one to reveal to us that, that God finds favor in us. She bears a child that reminds us of ourselves. Gonzalez rekindles the comfort we experience when we read the genealogy of Jesus and there find a Gentile like ourselves. The Gospel writer did not leave or hide the skeletons in Jesus' closet, but listed them so that we may know that the Savior has really come to be one of us, not just one of the high and mighty. Jesus is no Thomas Jefferson. He is an heir of a rich and diverse history, born of interactions of different races and cultures. He is, according to the Gospels, the son of Mary and Joseph, a skilled craftsman who eats, breeds, lives, loves, and suffers like the women of Divino. And he is one of us. Theologian Juan Luis Segundo answers the question, what is God like by asserting that God is like Jesus, opening up a world of inter interpretations on how simple people like the woman of Divino might understand their relationship to Jesus and God as re revealing the relationship that should exist between themselves and one another, a relationship of community, strength, and a move to service and action out of love. The final key to the mythical American dream, faith in God, presents us with the longing for understanding of why. Why in a nation that once promoted itself as a haven for immigrants that speaks about God and has God even on its currency, there are still many millions of outsiders, people who do not belong in, who are systematically kept on the margins. This nation has de employed divine providence and the Bible to sanction the westward movement of the United States <clears throat> and the people who would become her citizens. A correlation that has been coined manifest destiny, which I'm, all, we're, I'm sure we're all familiar with from our social studies class. It has resulted in an ongoing deterioration of the value and importance of people already here, people we Latinas and Latinos call our nanas and our tatas, our grandparents. We have been led to believe that this misconstrued understanding of faith in God is a key to unlocking the American dream when in fact it, along with education and hard work, are actually the locks that have been placed upon the door. Who then holds the true keys? Who is or who are the ones responsible for keeping us from making it and causing this need for healing? For healing? There are no easy answers and we cannot even be sure if an answer to this question exists. We can, however, posit how the Catholic Church, given that we are theologians in the Catholic University, may contribute to this issue. <clears throat> and so there exists in the field of theology the notion of a feel-good church and over-realized eschatology that may aid us in better understanding how the Catholic Church enacts a passive culpability and is in, is in part guilty of perpetuating the myth of the American dream. Theologian Ephraim Agosto cites Corinthian, the first letter to the Corinthians 4.8. Already you have all that you want. Already you have become rich. To show that to, hungry, to go hungry in the light of others being well fed, to have nothing when others have abundance, is not an experience remote for many in our day and age, including far too many Hispanics. There are issues, these are issues that do not stay in the times of the Apostle Paul. They have traveled through the paradigms of time and nestled themselves among our present day suffering communities in part because of the church's passive culpability. <clears throat> in an exercise led by Professor Cecilia Gonzalez Andreu, we are asked to simply state what we see when we are shown three parishes in Los Angeles. These are the three parishes. Beginning with St. Monica's Church, we notice a parish with a bell tower, stained glass windows, and well-kept surroundings. <clears throat> in the photo of St. Anne's, we notice a much smaller building, no bell tower, and a simple white cross. In the photo of St. Clement's Church, we notice a much smaller parish, plants with no boundaries, and located in what seems to be a repurposed building. <clears throat> Gonzalez Andreu informs us that St. Clement's Church is indeed housed in a repurposed building, serves a predominantly large Hispanic blue-collar population, and is located in Santa Monica, California, not too far from here. 
She shares that St. Anne's Church shares similar traits as it, also a, it is also a repurposed building, doubles as a school, and serves a predominantly la large Filipino and Hispanic community only a few blocks away from St. Monica's Church. We're informed that St. Monica's Church, only a few minutes drive south of St. Anne's and St. Clement, is a home parish to a small population of movie stars, producers, and the like. We also learned that St. Monica's Church is nearing its phase one goal of raising $27 million with gifts to date, totaling $21.5 million to make additions of a public square and dining area. This is what they're planning to transform <laughs> their church into. What, do, what though does St. Monica's have to do with over-realized eschatology? Augusto, who offers up some, um, some food for thought, might ask the parishioners of St. Monica's Church, the financially rich, to give to the collection for the poor of St. Anne's Church and St. Clement's Church, so that St. Monica's might follow the example of the spirituality, spiritually rich Jesus Christ, who enriched us all spiritually with his death on the cross. The death of a poor man at the hands of the powerful Romans, he reminds us. This petition is to be seen as a reminder of St. Monica's parishioners of their exalted giftedness, not just in their having social, higher, social standing than, sorry, higher social standings than those of St. Anne and St. Clement, but in being able to turn that giftedness into a more concrete monetary gift on behalf of its neighboring struggling churches. However, it should not stop here. In fact, it should not even begin here. There must be an attempt to achieve solidarity and community amongst these Christian denominationally Catholic parishes by accepting the socially marginalized as integral members of the Christian community and deserving of one another. While this is a small case study, it is nonetheless a reality faced by communities such as Dolores Mission in Boyle Heights, California, only 18 miles away from St. Monica's, and communities like Divino Nino Jesus. Simply by being exposed to this reality, it reveals, it reveals to us that none of us is uninvolved like it or not. Not to acknowledge it is, this is to remain in complicity and as members of the self-proclaimed universal church makes us in part responsible for these situations. We cannot stand back and permit ourselves to be silent, suffering and oppressed while a new guiltless national story is being written. We must begin to share in a vision that reveals the world will not always be as it is because we will not let it remain so. It is a vision that Gonzalez calls mañana he writes of mañana. Mañana is most often, sorry, I think I have. Mañana is most often the discouraged response of those who have learned the long and bitter experience that the result of their efforts seldom bring about much benefit to them or their loved ones. Mañana is much more than tomorrow. It is a radical question of today, a word on ju of judgment on today. For those who control the, pro the present order of society, today is a time to build for tomorrow. And tomorrow will bring about the fruits of what they sow today. The present is not always as rosy as some, as rosy as some would have us think. This is why we as Latinas and Latinos and ca Catholic Christians are constantly looking forward to mañana. This vision of mañana tells us we cannot and will not stand for our present situation today, but that we will recognize that change does not happen in a day. Mañana looks at today as a day and a time to build for tomorrow, and tomorrow will bring about the, bring about the fruits of what we sow in the unbearable today. This is a message that should be shared by our friends, our families, our neighbors, and those someones that know someone that know someone. The women of Divino have left their homes, their friends, their families, and their support systems por una vida mejor. The belief that hard work, hard work will get you where you want to be is just as misconstrued as the incomplete history many of these women have been taught and that their children likely learn in their public schools. Faith that God has provided has led them blindly into the reality that, of, of a life sometimes worse than the realities they face in their native homes. The sharing of experiences, both good and bad, by the woman of Divino are just some of the little stories of struggle, failure, family separation, and perseverance that Aponte, who uses the theological paradigm first introduced by the late Alejandro Garcia Rivera, believes helped develop more complete histories of Latina and Latino Christianity in the United States. Whether they be silenced or ignored, they are the little stories of Hispanic religion and culture, as well as a larger church in the United States that help us write the rest of our national story. We cannot speak for all of them, but we cannot speak without them. They are the stories of mañana, and we must choose to hear, respond to, and share them. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Daniel, for that beautiful speech. Um, in engaging the community of the Vino Niño Jesus in conversation with U.S. Latino, Latina theology, Daniel Mendez sits on a historical journey that exposes the root causes of the daily suffering and hardships experienced by the community of the Vino Niño, a group of religious women in Boyle Heights, California. Mr. Mendez begins his journey with the faith-sharing community of the Vino Niño who gather in group to share their, quote, experience of suffering and revealing their vulnerability to the group in hopes that the group might offer a sense of solidarity, hope, and comfort in the midst of others like them, end quote. The Divino women give testimonio to the social and economic reality in which millions of undocumented people live today and which Mr. Mendez refers to as in la lucha, in the struggle. In la lucha sets Mr. Mendez on a quest for answers to why these women continue to suffer unjustly in one of the wealthiest nations in the world. And why is the American dream denied to them? In his quest for answers, Mr. Mendez engages with the untold national story of Latina and Latinos in the U.S. that dates back to the early beginnings of this country. On this journey, Mr. Mendez uncovers that parallel to our American history commonly taught at schools across the country, there is an invisible story that has been ignored and silenced. In conversation with church historian and theologian Justo Gonzalez, Mr. Mendez uncovers that our national story is guilty of, quote, Indian massacres of riches drawn from slave labor, of neocolonial exploitation, and of any other guilty items that one may be inclined to forget in an innocent, innocent reading of history, end quote. Thus, it is in this innocent reading of our national story where Mr. Mendez uncovers some of the reasons why the Divino women's suffering remains invisible. Quote, we must choose to remember so that we do not repeat the same actions taken by our supposed innocent national story and grant us a perspective which is afforded by education on what it means to be in la lucha, so that we do not deny our fellow human beings the opportunity to fully, fully participate in our community." End quote. Mr. Mendez embarks on an analysis very similar to the process of conscientization inspired by Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator and scholar. According to Freire, Conscientization is a process where communities construct self-reflective social and political consciousness. This is very much true in Daniel's case study of the women of Divino Niño Jesus, who are empowered through the process of sharing their experiences, often ignored and silenced like so many stories of undocumented women. The Divino women have to chart their own space and own course in our national story. Yet the experience of these women must not only be understood as part of the history of the Americas and the ongoing process of globalization, but also as a beautiful story of struggle that Daniel reminds us must be heard, responded to, and shared. Mr. Mendez, excuse me, Mr. Mendez, in his study of the women of the Vino Niño, demands that we look our, at our national story. What do we want the story to look like? Who are excluded? As Christians, students, and part of a religious institution, how can we work together to change our national story and even our global story? As Isabel Allende reminds us, for real change, we need feminine energy in the management of the world. We need a critical number of women in positions of power, and we need to nurture the feminine energy in men. I would like now to draw my attention to the common assumptions 
the Divino women, like millions of immigrants from all over Latin America, have about the quality of life available only in El Norte and its direct link to the economic reality in Latin American countries today. Many economists, theologians, and sociologists point to NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, as having direct correlation to increase in immigration, especially from Mexico. According to the Pew Hispanic Center, 57% of those entering the country are from Mexico, are entering the country illegally from Mexico. Thus, it is of utmost importance that we also incorporate in our analysis the political and economic policies that force millions of immigrants to El Norte. A second point I like to draw attention to is that at times there is a reluctance to embrace the term feminism by some Latinas, possibly because of, the, of what the term might conjure up. But I sense that in Mr. Mendes' case study of the Divino women, there is a form of feminism, seen especially in their desire to gather as a group to discuss their hopes, fears, faith, and dreams. Given my concern for, for a more social and economic analysis, there's also a concern for gender analysis, which Mr. Mendez calls attention by mentioning the UN statistics on women's social reality, the work the, the Divina women do in and outside the home, and their quiet suffering, of course. So thus, do you think it is important to incorporate a gender and socioeconomic analysis of Hispanic women that looks at the role in our economy, social and religious institutions? Thank you. I told her we should bring this down.